Good afternoon. My name is Rashida Ng. I'm an associate professor at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University and the president of ACSA. Thank you all for joining us for this session. We are in the midst of a painful moment in the world, marked by continual acts of violence against Blacks and also by the increasing swell of voices demanding an end to over 400 years of systemic oppression against people of color, native and indigenous people. ACSA recently issued a statement addressing these racial inequalities that are far too pervasive in our society and that have gone on for far too long. We are committed to helping increase the understanding of the ways in which architecture and architectural education have perpetuated these inequities and also committed to empowering action to bringing about meaningful change. We acknowledge that we all have work to do and hope that this conversation will allow us to take one more step forward. Next slide, please. Over the past few months, ACSA's board and staff leadership, including Mike Monty, Eric Ellis, Kendall Nicholson, Danielle Dent, Lynn Dearborn, Robert Gonzalez, and I have engaged in racial justice training. Our schedule for this work was slightly disrupted by the pandemic, so we still have not completed all of our workshops. However, we understand the moment that we are in and the urgent need for action. We also know that some of our members have been engaged in social justice oriented work for many years outside of ACSA. And we hope that you will join us as we deepen our attention to racial equity. We have some brief remarks to share with you, including an overview of ACSA's previous work in this area, some reflections from our current training, and an overview of what we plan to do next. However, we have reserved the majority of our time together this evening for discussion, and we welcome the opportunity to hear from you. Mike? Thank you, Rashida. I will talk briefly about some of ACSA's efforts to address the underrepresentation of people of color in architectural education. This is not a thorough or wide ranging history, but attempts to bring some context to what we want to discuss in this session. Diversity has been on the list of priorities for architectural education and practice since before I started at ACSA in early 2004. From 1999 to 2003, ACSA gave the Robert R. Taylor Diversity Award, named for the first African-American architect in the United States. Yet the award said very little about race because it was intended, quote, to promote and increase exposure of architecture students to a more diverse range of architectural curricula and practice through faculty development. In 2005, with the participation of the collateral organization, excuse me, organizations, AIA engaged the law firm Holland and Knight to do an audit of existing demographic data concerning the architecture profession. Among the report's recommendations was to track the trajectories of students entering architecture school and through their careers to better understand what happens to the relatively diverse population of people of color and women who are entering school but not staying in the profession. It was an important realization at the time that schools were more diverse than the profession was. And yet in that audit, we also confirmed that historically black colleges and universities and the growing number of schools in Puerto Rico were significant sources of the African-American and Latinx students in the ACSA. From that report, NAB took its first steps to modernize its data collection, creating the system it has today and enabling longitudinal data about students and faculty. Taking a look at ACSA's strategic plans and board initiatives over this time, the need to increase underrepresented categories of students and faculty has been included consistently. In 2008, the ACSA board renewed the organization's commitment to quote diversity by benchmarking the member schools diversity plans, programs and initiatives, and by offering various venues for exchange of information on the topic. 
The print issues of ACSA News that year featured monthly columns that took different approaches to the topics of race, ethnicity, and gender. From this commitment, ACSA created the Diversity Achievement Award in 2010, recognizing effective methods and models to achieve greater diversity in architectural education, and specifically to incorporate the participation and contributions of historically underrepresented groups or contexts. It was not until 2015 that ACSA rewrote the strategic plan and began to prioritize equity and inclusion as opposed to diversity. Our education and leadership committees have pr produced various documents and conference sessions since the latest strategic plan was rewritten. In 2017-18, the Education Committee created a journey map that used socioeconomic equity to frame the path through architectural education and into the profession. They also produced the report, Moving Toward an Equitable Future, which culminated two years of data collection and conversation about ways schools actively seek to increase diversity and equity. Finally, ACSA's research capacity has grown over the years to include efforts to provide demographic and other data on architectural awards, student enrollment, faculty and administrators, and the career trajectories of graduates. To me, the arc of the approximately 15 years of history that I'm talking about shows a growing level of consciousness about what is actually required to realize change. What we are learning now is that so-called diversity was something we in ACSA and in architectural education sought at relatively little cost to the identities and practices that underpin our work. We are realizing that the dream of so-called diversity in the academy and the profession was premised on many people being recruited into a culture that itself has changed very little. I think we are now at a new point. Thanks, Mike. As Mike described, ACSA has sought to advance diversity for some time, and over the last five years during my time on the board, we have reaffirmed this commitment, seeking to become more inclusive and ultimately more equitable. Though I trust that these efforts have made an impact, I have also felt frustrated and discouraged with the slow pace of measurable progress. On a more personal level, as a Black woman architect and professor, I have been keenly aware of my own limitations to make more meaningful contributions. I have never been trained to address diversity and improve equity. And frankly, though I could offer insights about my lived experience, I couldn't provide much more. As I approached my term as ACSA president, humbled by this realization, yet still determined, I suggested that we hire a consultant to help us make more progress. After several months, we engaged Dr. Heather Hackman, a social justice educator to provide training on the issue of racism and white privilege to board and staff leadership at ACSA, as I previously mentioned. This has been one of the most rewarding and enlightening experiences of my career thus far. It is providing me, me with knowledge of some of the critical history of racial oppression that was absent in the curricula of my grade school, undergraduate and graduate educations. We have also been learning about the common missteps that can easily and inadvertently disrupt the most well-intentioned efforts to make progress in racial equity. Most importantly, this has helped me begin to recognize some of the historical and systemic issues within architecture that must be addressed if we are to advance our goals of racial equity. I am more conscious of the profoundly hurtful ways that the narratives of racial identity continue to inform and shape societal norms and behaviors, including the ways in which these narratives have chiseled away at my own sense of myself in the world. I am now more aware of the critical distinctions between diversity, cultural competence, and equity, and why it is essential to focus on advancing equity and justice to bring about the more visible changes in diversity that we seek. Finally, I am also more conscious of the ways in which white privilege and racial oppression are inextricably linked and the virulent effects of this unjust system on people of all races. As I conclude, I'd like to share some recent sketches. The first are likely familiar depictions of equality as seen here in which people of different 
heights are given the same resources in terms of their platform versus equity as shown here in which people with different needs are given different resources ultimately so that everyone regardless of height is able to see over the fence when first introduced to this metaphor it resonated with me it seemed to offer a useful way to think of the disparate needs of students and of our responsibility as educators to provide them with the tools they need to succeed more recently have returned to this metaphor and probed it through another lens are people of color native and indigenous people inherently short are we fundamentally lacking in skills and aptitude or is the system itself flawed next slide please has the ground on which people of color native and additional and, and indigenous people stand on been lowered depressed submerged so as to raise up the ground for whites to have a better view better access to resources and increased opportunities to succeed in our recent statement acsa committed to making architectural education more accessible inclusive and equitable to eradicate these long-standing inequities and to level the so-called playing field Lynn will now share some remarks about these future plans. Greetings. My name is Lynn Dearborn. I'm a professor at the University of Illinois and the president-elect of ACSA. Throughout my career, I focused on the importance of supporting diverse individuals in architectural education and in the profession. I've sought to understand needs in underserved communities and for vulnerable individuals. To support architecture that addresses those needs, and to give students opportunities to experience how the built environment disadvantages segments of the population as they go about their daily lives. This work has given me knowledge about what doesn't work, but despite more than 25 years of focus, these efforts have felt insignificant against the substantial need, the substantial change needed to create a more just world. In 2016-17, I chaired ACSA's Education Committee. Part of the committee's charge was to provide ACSA with a clearer picture of diversity in architectural education and recommend best practices to help member programs increase their demographic diversity. We ended the year with a list of 77 things you can do to make your program more diverse and welcoming, the basis for ACSA's Cards for Equity. I thought this effort had really made a difference when I walked into a School of Architecture Executive Committee meeting and saw the cards for equity sitting on the table in front of the director. We discussed the cards and how the school might implement some of the actions they outlined. Despite a historic representation of diversity for the school's executive committee, four females and one male, the action we vowed to take, the actions we vowed to take didn't result in groundbreaking change. In fact, they had very little impact at a time when our school's freshman class was visibly transforming to include many more students of color. We were seeing the diversity we'd hoped for, but didn't find success in retaining and supporting students of color. I teach 151 plus of those freshmen and transfer students each fall in the introduction to concepts and theories of architectural design. Yet despite doing what I understand from all my readings, and study are the right things, I lose a disproportionate number of students of color and know something different is needed. When Rashida suggested ACSA work with a social justice educator, I thought maybe it could provide what I had so far missed. When we began our training, to be honest, for me, it was uncomfortable. To have someone tell me I needed to dig deeper and understand history through a racial lens was a tough pill to swallow. I'd worked in East St. Louis for 10 years doing outreach with a broad set of community partners. I understood what everyday life was like for people in a low income black community. What else was there to know? Five months of training with Heather Hackman have made clear for me what I don't know and how much more there is to learn. However, there are a few things that I now understand and that will guide ACSA's efforts over the next years to undertake racial justice work within the organization and in support of this work among our members. First, 
Understanding the history of race and racial narratives is critical because this, this history underpins all that we do. The impact of this history on our structures, procedures, and policies is for the most part unexamined. What we take for granted in architecture, as in most of the rest of how we operate in North America, is based in a position of white privilege that disadvantages people of color and native and indigenous people. Once we understand and interrogate this history, we can reflect on how, it's in, how it impacts the status quo, what we think, and how we operate. Then we'll be prepared to make systemic change where everything must be scrutinized and open to revision. Second, this work cannot be about blaming or shaming. Most people act with the best of intentions. It must be about acknowledging that the status quo is racially unjust and supported by long accepted ideas about many dimensions of our field and how we deliver its education. For example, what makes compelling architecture? Accounts of the best ways to teach architecture and a mythology about the profile of the best students, designers and architects. We need to make room for new ways of doing what we do and welcome novel approaches that embrace the norms, interests, and needs of non-white people in their communities. We must remake what we do so that we respect the strengths of our students, fellow faculty, and potential faculty who are native, indigenous, and people of color. White people must accept that their share has to be reduced so that the ground represented in Rashida's graphic can be leveled to bring a greater portion of our field's finite resources to people of color, Native and Indigenous people. Today we begin a conversation focused on race and racial equity in architecture and architectural education. We anticipate periodic events to continue these conversations and move them forward toward effective actions within our organization and membership to eradicate long-standing inequities due to overt and covert forms of racism and white privilege. At the same time, at the level of the organization during my term as ACSA president, we intend to initiate a process to examine the organization's programs and operations through a racial equity lens. These are, the, these are initial steps to make architectural education more accessible, inclusive, and equitable, and to focusing on the value of people of color and native indigenous people have brought and continue to bring to the field of architecture and to architectural education. Now we'd like to move into breakout groups where we ask all of you to begin this discussion using the questions on this slide as the starting point. What conversations are happening in your school? We're interested. We, we wanna know where, where this is going. What conversations are not happening at your school that you think should be a focus? Where are the blind spots? What systems do you see in academia that reproduce racially unjust processes and outcomes? And what systems do you see in practice that re reproduce racially unjust processes and outcomes? <laughs> 